Closer than a brother. Through thick and thin, good times and bad times. I love this song choir is going to do. Um, I see grace is the title of the song. We look around all over the church, and we see God's grace. In different situations. Some is saving grace. Some is healing grace. Some. Families put back together, but we, but you can look all over the house and see God's grace. Pray for the choir as we sing this this morning.
it. Um, it's only been it's been a couple of weeks since we did this song, and uh, but uh, Sister Jane came to me in the stairwell, and she said, uh, "So, would y'all sing?" Ask me why. And uh, some people ask us to sing songs. All, you know, frequently some people come around and say, "Hey, would y'all do this?" And I, and I don't know that I remember a time that she's come to me and said, hey, would you sing that song? I told him, I said, we just did it a couple of weeks ago, but uh, somebody might have a need for it here this morning. Um, this song talks about a woman that slips through the door of the church, sits on the la- last pew. Now, this is not for those of you that are sitting on the back row today. It's just, it's just figurative the way the song was written. And... Uh, said she was bearing the weight of years of regret. She listened to the preacher when he stood up and said, if you're somewhere between doubt and believing, friend, I have the answer for all that you're needing. (laughs) Let us point you to Jesus a little bit today. Same quote. Yeah. 
William got this song out before service and was he played me just a bit of it we hadn't hadn't done it in, in a while hadn't heard him sing it in a while um, verse is when you consider the cross where the Savior bled and died for you when you imagine the pull for his passion to pay sin's price for you you cannot find words to say for such a gift thing as this you just can't call it what you want. You call it what it is. It's amazing what the Lord did for us. Um, so many times I think we get in a rut. You, we can get in a church rut where you go through the motions, where you come in and you know they're going to sing a song, they're going to take up an offering, they're going to sing a special, and the preacher's going to preach. And, and sometimes we can get caught in that, that spiritual rut of forgetting how amazing salvation really is. Um, we get caught up in, sometimes we get caught up in the, the Baptist beliefs and other things that, that, that kind of take over and, and kind of replace how amazing His grace really is to us today. I'm thankful today that He saved a seven-year-old sinner, but I'm thankful today He saves 87-year-old Sinners. It's not about age. I'm, not, I'm glad he saves the rich and the poor just alike. It doesn't matter the homeless. It doesn't matter who you are or station in life. This thing called grace, I mean, it's, it's, it's the only word to describe it is amazing. We didn't have to do a thing for it. Couldn't have done anything to earn it. Call it what it is today, folks. It's amazing. Sing it with you.
me You see I once was false but now I'm found was blind but now I see call it amazing Cause there's nothing quite like this Oh, call it amazing Just call it what it is Amazing Call it what it is Amazing Call it amazing Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. It is wonderful to be here today. I'm going to preach a message that I've already preached before. In fact, I preached it all night long last night. God has been dealing with me very very strongly about this particular subject. And uh, if I take off my coat, Mildred's going to pass out. Would somebody please take her out, please? It's a little warm up here, and you know my circumstances, and I know that if I have to do that, then you will understand. I've been going through a little battle, and you know all about that. Don't want to reflect on me. I want to praise God. I want to lift Him up today. It is amazing, that grace of God. So you might need to fill two or three of these cups up. I'll just take a sip at a time and make it last. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Second Chronicles, chapter number 7. As we look at this passage of Scripture, Isaiah is revealing to us the circumstances of, his, of the nature of Israel at that particular time, the people, the Jewish people, God's chosen. Of course, they were human, and you know how humans drift. Humans become humans. I mean, uh, hot one day and cold was a turkey the next day. God was getting a little fed up with that situation that was going on with that nation. Now remember, they were the chosen ones. Now they were not under grace, but they were under the law. They did not worship as we worship today. They had to go to the uh, one certain place to worship. They had to go to the temple to worship. They had to go to a certain place and offer sacrifices. They had to be, it had to be a blood sacrifice. They had become a little slack in that. Maybe sometimes it had to be a perfect lamb. Symbolic of the perfect sacrifice that God was going to send to Jesus Christ. They'd gotten a little slack on that and they were killing and eating the perfect and sending them perfect Offer up to God. Well, God got fed up with that crowd and says, I'm just going to have to do something about it. So he sends the great prophet Isaiah over to give them a message. In verse number 12, these are the words that was given as the Lord spake. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night, and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. Now that was the dedication of the temple. There was the earthly temple that was there in Jerusalem. 
It is no longer there. Mike and I had the privilege of traveling to Israel and we saw and to Jerusalem and we saw the site, but the temple is not there any longer under the remain, remnants of a wall. You see, when you sin against God, God brings judgment on a nation. And that is exactly what God has done to Israel. So he's warning them, he says, if I, but now he's challenging them, and he says, if I shut up the heavens that there be no rain, and if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, now from here down to the rest of the verse 15, it is applicable to today's people. Listen as I bring this message. If my people, you see, God had chosen that it not be ritual worship. He wanted personal worship. Like we've been doing today, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. He wanted a personal relationship and sacrifice of his own self and birthed us into his family, making us part of him and then part of the, in, the, in the church, and therefore we have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are His chosen people today. The Old Testament, the Old Testament economy is gone. Do you know when it was wiped away? At the place called Calvary. The blood sacrifice, the permanent, perfect blood sacrifice. God himself, Jesus Christ, was nailed to the cross. Changed everything. Changed it. There's a new day. We're living in that new day. But now we're drawing down to the challenges of the day. So what this applies in those days is applicable to us in this present day in which we are living Listen to the challenge from the Word of God. If my people, today His people are the church, the body of Jesus Christ, saved, sanctified, and on our way to heaven. So the message now today becomes a message to the church, not to the lost world. Oh, listen, get beyond what they're doing out there. We'd better be more concerned with what we're doing in here how we are presenting ourselves to God, how we're acting before God, how we are operating the church is the way God wants us to operate the church, how we are to be faithful to the service of God. You see, people, when God saved you, you became part of His body. And He laid down the things that He wants us to do. He says, what? They are not to assemble themselves together on the first day of the week as a matter of some is. He didn't say, well, now if there's a baseball game, that's okay. Didn't get any big men's on that one, Brother Alton. But now if we got a family picnic, that's more important than going to the house of God. You know what we always did, the way I was raised? We went to the family picnics after church. We put God first. That was the way America was raised, to put God first. We are at the door. The great falling away. This message is not going to be popular. But I don't want to personalize anyone. I'm not pointing fingers to any person. You see, when I point out that way, I got a thumb pointing back to me because I'm responsible and I have to answer to God just like every one of you do. Listen to what it says. My people, we, the church, the body, the living Christ, the body. Hey, listen, he's coming for the body. And if you're saved today, you're part of that body. If you're saved today, you're going to go to heaven. You're going to go up in the rapture either you may go by the way of the grave, but you will be in the rapture. When he comes down, he says, that we're going to meet him in there, and then so shall we be together, meet the Lord in there, and so shall we be together. We're going to go home together. Now, for you unsaved folks, 
This is not crazy. For you unsaved folks, this is Bible. This is reality. We are at the door. I'm not going to give I'm not going to begin to address some of the things that are happening right now in this world. You've, you've got a, you've got you're intelligent. You can read the newspapers, you can listen to the news on the TV. Dear friend, this world is reeling and rocking and in a mess. Isn't that the condition that the Lord said just before he came back? We are at the door. This is not a prophetic message, but listen to me very, very carefully. If my people, you see, this warning is to the church, the saved folk, which are called by my name. I'm glad to be called a Christian. I'm not ashamed to be called a Christian. I'm not ashamed to be called one of the little, little Christ-like ones. But now, what about if we get into a social environment at work, our friends gathering together out in the yard and having a yeah, 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 yeah. And the word comes up, well, now, are you one of us? Well, you know, I go to church. I, occasionally, I do. You know what you're doing? You're saying to God, you're ashamed of him. He said he'd be ashamed of us. Oh, I don't want him to be ashamed of me. I want to stand true to the last breath. I want to say, well, hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. <laughs> Come on in, Melvin. <laughs> Whew. When he says that, buddy. I'm not going to be lagging back. So, well, now wait just a minute. I got some more things I want to do. I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to have to leave Mr. Bill, did My boys, my family, church family. That's human. You see, no one, no one's just just hankering to go, just hankering to die. But I'm hankering to see Jesus. I am hankering to see Jesus. If my people, which are called by my name, notice this very carefully, shall humble themselves. You know what's wrong with America today? We've got so much stinking pride. Well, I'm an American. Look what I am. We're here in America. We have it all. Yeah, and the government's about to take it all away from you, too. My goodness gracious, every time you turn around, they're raising the taxes. Every time they turn around, they're putting some more law on you, binding you down, holding you down. And pretty soon they're going to have it all wrapped up. And you're not going to have any wiggle room, but that's a message for another day. But right now, I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud that I was born in a land where I could hear the gospel. That I could worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And not be persecuted for it now. But Brother Joe, I don't know how much longer we're going to have that, or that privilege. We're living in dangerous times. Unprecedented times. For you who do not know this Jesus, the Lord is sending out, God is sending out His last calls. Now, I'm not saying today is the last day, but I am telling you the time of the end of the rapture of the church and the beginning of the great tribulation is right on us. The things that are happening in this world today, the things that have happened just recently in America today are written in the book not going to preach on prophecy, but I just had to bring that in to show you how close we are and try to awaken your eyes to the fact that, hey, listen, America is about to go down the tube. Your security is going with it. Oh, but what about my social security? I'm not worried about my social security. I'm worried about my health and my security. 
That's all I'm worried about. And I'm really not worried about that because I know in whom I believe and I know who I'm persuaded and I know where I'm going and I know that when I get there, oh, it will be heaven for me. I'll be able to see my loved ones. Be able to see all my family up there when we get there together. Be able to be able to see all of hers and she'll see Chloe and I'll see Dot. It's going to be heaven. But listen, if you're not saved today, there's a message for another day for you. If you don't know this Jesus today, The Bible says that there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's called the lake of fire. It's called burning hell. I've had people to tell me, oh, you preachers, you just try to scare people into joining your church. It's talking about that hell and the hell fire. Well, I'll tell you what, if I could scare you out of hell, I'd do the best I could, but I cannot do it. Only the Holy Spirit coming into your heart, convicting you and showing you which way you're going is the only thing that's going to make a difference. The only different thing that's going to make a difference. He says, seek my face, so we're supposed to seek after the Lord and, from, and turn from that wicked way. You know the reason so many people today won't receive Jesus? Simply because they don't want to turn loose of their lifestyle. Oh, but I want to tell you, Brother Matthew, you just don't know I have so much fun on Friday night. Boy, I get with my drinking buddies and we drink and we have fun and we just cut up and do all kind of things. And on Saturday night, yeah, and on Sunday morning, you wake up with a hangover so much your head's just going to explode. Big time. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Not worth it at all. Oh, listen. This is a warning now. The next portion of this verse is a warning. Turn from their wicked ways. Turn to Jesus. Walk away from that old life and sin. And by the way, you were born in that condition. But you're reborn in the other condition. There's a natural birth and there's a spiritual birth. Natural birth and you die that way, you're going to burn in hell. Spiritual birth, you're birthed in the family of God and you're going to go to heaven. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. It says, turn from thy wicked ways. And here's the promise. Listen very carefully to the promise. Thank God there's a promise. Then will I hear from heaven. Oh, dear Lord, my friend, when you call on Jesus, He's listening and He's going to answer and He's going to call back, I hear what you're saying. When we pray, we don't just pray to have it bounce around the room here. When we pray, we just so it just does not heard by the people that are surrounding you, hear it within hearing distance of what you're saying. When you're praying, your prayers go over the battlements of heaven. And they're given to God. Brother Melvin, how do they get there? God takes care of that. I believe the Holy Spirit does a little bearing in our case. See that down there, God. That's that altar Westside Baptist Church today this morning. You see that one down there? Yeah, I see him. He says he wants to be part of your family, God. God says, right now, he is. Whew. I'm a good mind to shout. As I was contemplating this verse of Scripture, 
yesterday and reading over it, and I was trying to outline it this way and outline it that way, and was nothing clicking or ticking, Brother Joe. But then all of a sudden, God said, quit outlining and let me tell you. Threw away my outlines that I was working on, and I said, okay, God, you take over. What I'm giving to you tonight was not rehearsed or put on paper, but it sure was preached to me last night all night long in my bed. I did, I mean, my word. I was being so still, so quiet, I knew good and well if I moved, Bill would jump up and say, what's wrong? It sure is good to have communication with God. He says, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. And I will heal their land. <laughs> Do you know what's wrong with America today? America has turned their back on God. They've declared that there is no God. They've said, we're not going to have God mentioned in the schoolhouses. They've said in the government places, they cannot mention God. They cannot pray at the football games any longer. They even in the national sports they won't let. Them. They say this is this is no no. You don't do that anymore. You've got to be political, and everybody wants to be politically correct. Nobody's worried about God. But here's the thing: God has the last word. I never thought I'd live to see the day when prayer would be taken out of the schoolhouse. When I was at Granville Baptist Church years ago when I was in high school, from the first grade till the time I graduated, we started with a chapel service, a homeroom service. We'd have a Monday morning, we'd start the week with a chapel service. Gathered together, and the principal would read the scripture, and then, we, the, and then we'd have a prayer, and then we would sing a song that had, had something to do with, with God. And when we get into our homeroom, our teacher every morning, she'd open the Bible and she'd read. We'd recite the Lord's Prayer. Dear Lord, these people, these kids, they don't even know there's a prayer for the Lord. We'd recite the Lord's Prayer. And do you know what? After that, we started, prayed the Lord's Prayer. We stood and prayed the Lord's Prayer. But after the Lord's Prayer, you know what we did? We pledged allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And they don't do that anymore. It's a no-no. But let some of those foreigners bring their flags over. And, oh, it's all right with them, you know. But they're not America anymore. Why? America, has, they turned their back on America, and God is turning his back on our land. Verse 19 says, But if I turn away and will forsake the, my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before thee, and shall go, and serve other gods, or oh, and worship them. Then will I pluck them up by the root. Oh, this is judgment, judgment, judgment. Out of the out of the land which I have given them, and this house which I have sanctified in my name, the church, church of the living God, not just individual houses, but the church, the body of Jesus Christ. I have, uh, for my name, will will I cast out of my sight? And will make it to be a proverb and a byword among nations. And this house which is high shall be a, a, an admonishment to everyone that perishes by it, passes by it, so that he shall say, Why hath the Lord done this unto this land and unto this house? And it shall be answered because they forsook the Lord. America is just about gone. The Lord God of their fathers. America was founded on people who were searching a place where they could worship God. Now they're taking God out of our worship. And they're putting sports. And the football heroes, baseball heroes, all kind of heroes like that, 
in their place, and we are supposed to honor them and recognize them, but don't say anything about Jesus. America's gone. You say, well, Brother Bill, what hope do we have? Boy, you're so gloom and despair. What hope? Let me tell you about the hope now. Jesus. Jesus. He came to this low ground of sin and sorrow. He died on an old rugged cross. Three days later, came out of that grave, ascended 40 days later back into the heavens, and they said, this St. Jesus that you see going away, he's coming again in like manner. Jesus. We're living in those days of his return. Everything in the book of Revelation. I don't have time to go into that. Everything in the book of Revelation is there. Everything has been fulfilled. Everything's lined up for those seven years of tribulation. We're at the door. Why cannot they stop the Muslims and the things that are... Uh, by the way, they're just now beginning to attack America. Hey, this is just a scratch on the surface. Oh, my dear friend, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming to your door, my door. But hallelujah, Jesus coming into my heart and I'm going with him one of these days. What about you? What about you? Well, Brother Melvin, you're scaring the daylights out of me. I don't know if I'm coming back anymore. That's between you and God. But all I've done is give you the Bible truth today. It's been hard. I'll tell you what, this medicine that I'm taking right now is supposed to do me, it's, it's supposed to do me good. I don't like it, but it's supposed to do me good. Some of that medicine y'all take, don't, you don't like it, but it's supposed to, it does you good. What about you? Every head bowed, every eye closed.